you can hear me quite well. So it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you very much for the organizers, the Tom Lantos Institute, to invite me. Uh, this is my first time in this uh, minority summer school. It's a pleasure for me to be here. As Marco says, I'm uh, coming from Sweden, from the Raoul Wallenberg Institute. It's an institute that is devoted to develop, develop human rights-related capacities. So we have a lot of programs around the world for uh, capacity development of different kind of uh, actors in different continents, in different countries, on human rights and humanitarian law. Myself in particular, I'm, I'm responsible for different programs, but I'm part of the academic staff, so I'm a doctor in law. I did my PhD nearby here at the University of Trento, north of Italy, but originally I come from Argentina. So I studied law in Cordoba many years back, then moved to Europe, did my PhD, and after moved even northern to Sweden, where is my base right now, and I'm working with uh, minority rights, indigenous people rights, and in particular with the inter-American system. Uh, actually, I just came back from a conference in Rome, where with a colleague we presented a paper on the protection of minority, minority rights and child rights within the inter-American system. Very interesting. But today we will have two lectures with you. Uh, one this morning, but the two of them this morning, one and a half hours each. And the idea is to have an uh, overview of the inter-American system and then to review a little bit the case law of the inter-American court related <coughs> to the protection of minorities and focus on indigenous people rights. Uh, on my doctoral dissertation, I wrote on the protection of cultural diversity within the inter-American system. Cultural diversity as a legal standard. I will come back to that uh, later on during, during the day. I know that you are quite many, and it will be difficult to remember your name <laughs> if we go around. <laughs> and I think every time that someone new comes, you present yourself, probably. So we will not do that. But if you want to participate, ask questions or... or intervene in any manner, just please say your name and where you come from and uh, just to start a little bit of an interaction between us. Uh, I like interactive sessions, so please stop me, ask questions and we can go back and forward as many times as you, as you want. <coughs> many of you have been in contact with the inter-American system before in your studies? Many? So some of you come from Latin America, I suppose. So that's, uh, that's good. So you can help me to pass knowledge to your colleagues. So please uh, join me with this. And, and uh, if you have comments or personal questions to, to ask, do it. The Inter-American system, as you see, covered the, the Americas, from the south corner of South America to the top in Canada. So it's the entire continent. So cover the three Americas, the South America, Central America, and North America. So you can see it in blue. Uh, the main organization that protects human rights within the Americas is the Organization of American States, right? As you heard yesterday, the sister organization in Europe is the Council of Europe, as it is, for example, the African Union within the African continent. So the OAS, and I will talk a little bit about that, it has been, is the framework organization. We have a specific institutions that protect human rights, and we will talk about them as well. Here you see some uh, pictures of the human rights battles, including indigenous people's uh, battle for recognition and protection of their rights. Uh, those are, well, there are many human rights issues in the Americas, but those are some of them. A little bit of history about the OAS. It's a very old organization, uh, as most of the human rights organizations that today we have. The OAS was born after the Second World War, but already started before. So the, the America has been very active in the institutional organization of the continent, in particular in order to uh, protect the independence of the states, to support the independence of the states, and the non-intervention principle in international law. So, but after the Second World War, the time was ready in order to create this 
uh, organization focus on three main elements as the Council of Europe. The rule of law, democracy, and human rights. So if you read the OAS Charter, uh, that was adopted in 1948, uh, you, will you will see that these three elements are very clear throughout the Charter. And it's exactly the same what happened in Europe with the Council of Europe. So the needs of strength and democracy, strength and rule of law after the Second World War was quite clear. 35 members, uh, all states in the Americas are members of the OAS. All of them are part of the organization. But during some period, some member state has been, the government of, for example, Cuba has been excluded during many years because the lack of democratic government in uh, the island. But also, for example, uh, it has been a situation with uh, Honduras that it has been uh, suspended for a very short period when the coup that happened a couple of years ago. The headquarter is in Washington, and there's no surprise about that. Uh, in <laughs> Latin America, we said that God, especially a couple of decades back, God is everywhere, but if you want to talk with it, you have to go to Washington. <laughs> I'm not sure if it's still true, but certainly at the time of creation of the OAS, that was the case. So, uh, be aware of that. Why Cordoba is important? Do we have an institution of Cordoba in Cordoba? No? I was born there. <laughs> so that's the place where I come from. So every time that I fly back to, to the Americas, and I do it at least once a year, uh, the inter-American system protects my rights. And that's important because as we are here today, all of you, even those that are not coming from a European country, you are protected by the Council of Europe and the European Convention of Human Rights, just by the fact that you are in the territory of a member state of the Council of Europe. The same happened here. Argentina. Is, uh, has ratified the American Convention of Human Rights. Therefore, when I fly back to my home country, my rights are protected by that, that instrument. <coughs> Talking about the institution. So, when we talk about human rights system, we have two, uh, three main pillars for human rights protection, including minority protection. We have the institutional protection, and we have the uh, framework protection. So the instruments has to be adopted that are essential because it's the recognition of our rights, but also the institution that allow the effective implementation of those rights. Which are the two main instruments that we have in the Americas? Well, probably you heard about the Amer Inter-American Convention of Human Rights, but we also have a declaration. And that declaration has been uh, one of the, if not the first, modern human rights instrument that we have in the world was adopted seven months before of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So, to a certain extent, the declaration worked as a trap for the Universal Declaration, because if you read the two instruments, they are quite similar. The American Convention came almost after 20 years, well, actually 21 years, and uh, that is not uh, casual, because one thing is to be able to adopt a declaration, and other thing is to be able to adopt a convention. Do you know the difference between the two? So, are you all lawyers here? No, so some of you not. Those that are not lawyers, are you familiar with the difference of declaration and convention in international law? More or less. <laughs> <You're> thinking, no. <laughs> well, it's very simple. I will say it very shortly. A declaration is a non-binding instrument. So, state agree on specific rights or specific statement, and they assume the moral obligation to to recognize those rights, those statements, and act accordingly to those statements. But when they decide to ratify, to sign or ratify a convention. That's a binding instrument. So they have an obligation under international law to implement those rights and obligations recognizing that instrument within their national system. If they don't, 
they violate international law. And that could have consequences in international law. So one thing was the adoption of the Declaration in 1948, where states, as with the Universal Declaration, they said, well, these are the human rights that we think are the rights that need to be protected within the region. But no specific obligation derived from it. There is a little bit of deception now, but I will discuss that later. 20 years took the American <coughs> state to change that approach from a non-binding instrument to a binding instrument. And that gives you an idea about the region. So the region is very good to move forward on declarations. I'm not sure if my colleagues from Latin America will agree on that, uh, but that's my my perception after years of uh, observing what happened in Latin America. It's very good in making declarations, but when the time to introduce real changes arrive, then we have problems. And as we see here, the state were very quickly in order to agree at the level of a moral statement, but they have problems to arrive to a binding instrument and therefore to assume the obligations under international law to modify their national systems, their constitutions, their laws, in order to provide effective recognition of those rights. And that's something that still happens today. Institutional pillars. So those are the main two instruments. There are others who will come back, including some particular instrument for the protection of minorities. And then we have three institutional pillars. We have one court, that is the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, based in San Jose of Costa Rica. The commission, which is based in Washington, because it's older, has been created in 1959, uh, so even before the adoption of the American Convention. And then we have the national systems, which role is essential. It's not minor. We are talking about an inter-American system for protection of human rights. And without the judiciary at the national level, there is no system. Because, and, and this is valid for all the system, for the European, for the uh, African system, for the inter-American system. The protection, the main protection, always should happen, and in general happen at national level. So if you think how many cases go to the regional instances, there are just a few in connection with the large bus violations that happen every day at national level. So the main target for any human rights advocate working with minority rights or uh, with any kind of uh, human rights, different focus groups, is the national protection. Of course, if you cannot uh, receive redress just at national level, in some regions, you have the luxury to have a regional system, but not everywhere in the world. We know that in Southeast Asia, in the Arab countries, you don't have regional systems. So in those cases, well, sometimes you can go to the treaty bodies in UN. But in other cases, your only response will come from the national judicial system. Any question or comments so far? Please, I will give you my offer. Ah, thank you, Mark. Thank you very much. My name is Andrea Spitaski. I'm a legal officer at Minority Rights Group International. And uh, I have a question. You mentioned that um, the declaration was adopted a couple of months before the Universal Declaration mm -hmm. of Human Rights. And as far as I understood, uh, the Organization of American States was also established one year before the Council of Europe. Mm -hmm. So, was it also an example for the, the establishment of the Council of Europe? Because you mentioned that it has the same three values, the rule of law, democracy, mm -hmm. and human rights. So, somehow, it seems that the European system was established or copied the good example of the Americas. Is it right? Politically, yes, but if you read the, ch the charter of the Council of Europe and the OAS, they are not, they are not similar. So there, there is an um, autonomous development in Europe, but the moment was the same. It was a momentum, not only for the development of the institution at the universal level, but also at the regional level. But for what happened in Europe, the European states were 
absolutely more ready to assume binding obligations. So the European Convention of Human Rights was adopted in 1950. So they signed the charter and they immediately adopted a binding instrument for human rights protection without minority clauses in it. So if you read the European Convention of Human Rights, the text, you will not find specific articles for minority protection. That does not mean that minorities are not protected in Europe. So far to say that, because after that there has been institutional developments and also the jurisprudence that has been crafted for particularly provide for protection to minorities. Uh, but it's also part of the momentum of the development of universal human rights. In the 50s, uh, the idea, the prevalent idea in the doctrine and in the scholars, politicians, was that rights should be universal. No need for a specific protection. If you protect the rights of everybody, regardless of race, gender, sex, uh, national origin, everybody will enjoy the rights. The reality uh, show us that specific protection is needed. But that came uh, much, much later. So, but it's true that these two systems, the inter-American system and the European system, has been developed in parallel. For example, when the, uh, the inter-American convention, the American Convention for the Protection of Human Rights was adopted, it follows the European Convention of Human Rights. It, Again, it introduced a commission and a court, as it was the European Convention of Human Rights at the time. Later on, the European Commission was uh, abolished in 1999, but the inter-American system kept the commission. Partially because the commission was created before the court, and therefore it has its own autonomous mandate. Not only a mandate coming from the convention, but also a mandate coming from the charter. And therefore, the Commission is very keen to keep uh, its own mandate separate from the court. Any other question or comments regarding this very initial development? Let's see. So, just for you to remember, especially for those that are not lawyers, uh, in case of violation at national level, and in case that judicial system at national level do not provide the address of justice, you have two different alternatives. And those alternatives are not hierarchically connected. Either you go for the protection at regional level or at international level through the, tre the treaty bodies procedures. But you cannot go to both. Because if you do that, most likely the state authorities will interpose an exception that is called litis pendentia. That's mean that when a case has been resolved for another judicial authority at the international level, the next one will declare incompetent because you already received your chance to be protected at the international level. So the litis was pending on another jurisdiction. So in that case, you have to choose which system will better protect your rights. How to do that? Any idea? Any comments? Those that are lawyers, uh, legal officers, how you will advise your client in that case? Yes. Thanks. Hi, I'm Luciana from Argentina also. And I believe that uh, in the case of Argentina, the best way, as the other class I said, is the regional system, mm. because then you can have like a binding sentence for the state and um, in, for the, in the other side, the universal system, there are only recommendations and as they are not binding for the state, it's more difficult to uh, protect your rights. Yeah. I, I believe that. That's a very good, uh, very good observation. Thanks, Luciana. Uh, Another recommendation. Uh, Tell us. Uh, Annie from Yerevan State University, Armenia. Yeah. Um, I will make some investigation in case study and will um, investigate some previous um, cases. Case law. Yes, and we'll see if my um, case is more will be more protected in which system. Yes. Yeah. 
Excellent, as well, excellent. Uh, so it's not only about the formal requ uh, requisite, and also there are differences on that, and I will give you one, but also the chances to win your case. So if you know how in a specific court and a specific treaty body treat a similar cases, have treated similar cases than yours, then you can predict the result of your case. And that's very important, because most likely what you want is to win the case. So that's very important in connection with strategic litigation. And in minority right protection, strategic litigation is key. Most of the development in connection with the standard of protection for minorities came after strategic litigation. And that is very important. For example, in the latest case of coming from the Latin American system, we have an advisory opinion for the protection of gender identity and transsex in January 2018, this year. It's still in Spanish. Uh, I will talk a little bit more later on. But the translation into English will come uh, soon, in a couple of months. And I really recommend to read it. And that is a case of strategic litigation at state level. <laughs> because it was the state of Costa Rica that decided strategically to push forward for that development. So when you decide where to go, keep in mind the result. But also the requirements. For example, at the universal system treaty bodies, you don't have a limitation of time after the adoption of the final judicial decision within the national jurisdiction. One of the requirements to go for a regional system is the exhaustion of national, uh, national remedies, domestic remedies. And in the Inter-American system, you have six months since the adoption of the last resolution for the highest judicial authority within the country. If you miss those six months, you can, the state can interpose that exception, and your case will be declared inadmissible. In the universal system, you don't have that limitation. Therefore, even if two years, three years has passed, you can still go. The same about, for example, compensation. If what your, your client, the victim, wants is a monetary compensation, the universal system is not the way to go, because they almost never provide uh, compens compensations, monetary compensations. They provide the compensation in the form of declaration of the violation. But at the regional level, the, especially in the inter-American system, the compensations and the measure of reparations are very, very developed. You will not only get monetary compensation, but also a series of reparations that are very important, especially for minorities. For example, a public apology from state authorities, the publication of the case in uh, main journals, the modification of national law, a direct order to uh, state authorities to modify national law in line with the convention uh, at regional level. So, different ideas. But keep in mind that these are the two avenues that you can uh, choose in case of uh, not redress at national level. Some uh, other dates that are important within the system. As you see, it took a while from the adoption of the convention to the issue of the first judgment at the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. It took more than almost 20 years between the adoption of the convention, when the convention ended into 4, 78, and the issue of the first judgment, 88. So it was a very, very slow process. But since uh, 1988, when the court issued the first judgment in the case of Velasquez Rodriguez versus Honduras on forced disappearances, the court has been speeding up the cases. And today we have, I think, 234, no, 340 cases around that has been uh, adjudicated by the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. If you compare that with the European Court of Human Rights, well, the numbers are completely different. In the, in the European Court of Human Rights, thousands of cases have been adjudicated. 100,000 cases are pending. So it's a, it's a completely different world. 
and there are reasons why that happened. One of the reasons is because the system is not that well known within the region. If you talk with the European colleagues and you ask them here if they th what they think about the European system, well, most likely you will heard about the European system at your universities if you study law. You will heard within the bar associations after you start practicing. You will heard from colleagues. So you will know <coughs> that there is a European system. You will read on newspapers. There will be information on the TV to time to time, etc., etc. When I was at school, many years back, in Cordoba, I never talked about it. Mm -hmm. I never heard about the inter-American system. In international law, we studied the, com the, the Convention of Law of the Sea, the main uh, bodies of the United Nations, international humanitarian law, the Convention for the for, uh, Purchase of Goods, but we never heard about the inter-American human rights system. How come then that the lawyer will use it within his or her daily practice? Impossible. Nobody tell you the system is inexistent. And that's something that I think that's why it's important this kind of uh, forum, where the information is spread. So when you know that there are instances for protection of minorities, where are instances where you can take your cases, where you can advocate, where you can raise awareness. Uh, but it's still not the case in the inter-American system. So a regular lawyer in our countries will not even consider the possibility to submit the case to the commissions and then to the court. That do not exist. Excuse me. Yes. That's a question. Sorry to ask that at this time, but I think it's What's your name? Uh, I am Syed Tahseen Raza and I teach uh, international politics at Aligarh Muslim University in India. Uh, my question is, uh, we can understand that uh, this inter-American system is less known in other parts of the world. But what is the reason that uh, uh, in that very part of the world where it is, it is not well known? That is, what is the reason for that? Uh, there are uh, many reasons. One reason is that when the system was developed, uh, it was developed quite early, then historical changes happened within those countries, including military governments, coup, uh, <laughs> internal wars, invasion from US forces into other countries, etc., etc. So the focus was not on the protection of human rights, but was the struggle between the two superpowers and the Cold War that was taking place within Latin America in order to avoid uh, the influence of the Soviet Union on the Latin American system. So, at that time, I think the United States has a very strong influence within the region, more than today, and uh, the focus was to strengthen the system in order to avoid the entrance of communism, not to strengthen the system for the protection of human rights. So, the violation of human rights systemic violations were tolerated during the uh, region wide, during many, many decades. That changed only during the redemocratization of the region in the late 80s. And since then, if you see the, the level of ratification of the Inter-American Convention, rush. Because before that, well, that was not the priority, it was not part of the regional agenda. Uh, there is a difference between the European system and the inter-American system. In order to be part of Council of Europe, you have to ratify the European Convention of Human Rights. You cannot be part of Council of Europe, the political body, without human rights, without rat ratifying the convention. It's a requirement. In the inter-American system, you can be part of the political body, sit around the table, discuss regional political issues, and never ratified the uh, American Convention. In fact, most of the, one of the most powerful countries, if it's not the most powerful country in the region, the United States, never ratified the Convention. And that gives you an idea. So it's not the priority. Uh, among the 35 states that are part of OAS, today only 23 countries are part of the Convention. 
So there are 12 countries that are not part of the American Convention of Human Rights. Is because they don't believe in human rights? What do you think? Colleagues from Latin America. Hi, um, actually I'm not from Latin America, but I have a guess. Um, What's your name? My name is Aykut, and I'm from okay. Turkey. Um, I think that like, if we look at the US case, I guess they don't want to confer their sovereignty mm. to a supranational organization. That's why I think they don't sign the convention. Yeah. Any other idea? Please, here we have. Your name? I'm Paula, I'm from Ecuador. Nice to meet you. Um, you too. <laughs> I think it's maybe because in Latin America we don't have a supranational uh, entity like the European Union. So governments tend to be reluctant towards um, something that will bind them at the legal level. So, for example, in Ecuador, there is, we, we don't have so many cases that have gone to the, to the court and the OAS. And I think that is this reluctancy of the, this need to be independent at the legal level and the lack of integration within the region. Hmm. Thank you very much. Another one? Hmm. Ah, no, I thought you were. Uh, yes, please. Uh, my name is Emily, I'm from Canada. I was just wondering um, whether, um, and I know it's the case in some parts, but I'm just wondering your opinion in how the fact that the OAS is based in Washington mm -hmm. and the fact that there is such a strong history of American imperialism in Latin America, mm -hmm. uh, whether that is also a factor in terms of the OAS being seen as controlled by Washington, it gives it a lot of money and being a kind of a way of influencing Latin America politics. It's a little bit more indirect than sending the Marines, but still. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, very good uh, points, all of you. I will start <laughs> with the Marines. <laughs> uh, well, hopefully the Marines, they will be busy doing other better things <laughs> elsewhere. But <laughs> uh, since, the, since many decades we don't have physical intervention within uh, the territory of any Latin American country. Uh, which the is, Marines are in Haiti right now, but yes. Uh, but consensually. Uh, no, but no. <laughs> no, but uh, you know, in Haiti we have the UN mission as well, so there are also troops from Brazil, from Argentina, yeah. so it's a slightly different situation. But uh, without defending the United States, it's true that OAS has been heavily criticized, uh, even recently, by many different countries in the region, uh, as a political fora that pursue American interests. Uh, and uh, that is an open debate, so we cannot deny it. Is that especially countries that perceive that the OAS is used in order to target them. Some countries, I believe that the, uh, the position is a desperate position. For example, the situation of Venezuela. So Maduro is one of the stronger voices nowadays, the president of Venezuela, saying that OAS is biased and is for up for the American intervention within the political spectrum of the Latin American countries. Well, the situation of Venezuela speaks for itself. Unfortunately, the uh, systemic problems that the country has today, uh, as determined not by OAS in itself, but also by the uh, Inter-American Commission, are quite clear. Uh, how to resolve that? Well, uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, OAS is a political forum where countries resolve political dynamics between them. And of course, the United States is a big player. We cannot deny that. It's a big player worldwide, and is indeed a big player within the OAS. But the other countries also have a power of initiative. In connection with human rights, I would say that the United States is not the biggest players within the OAS. Other countries, in particular Costa Rica, 
Brazil, Argentina, uh, Uruguay, Paraguay, has been quite proactive in developing human rights standards within the region. And the uh, United States never used sort of better power to avoid those developments, as long as will not be applicable to it. So there is always in, in the OAS, and I think that is the difference between the Council of Europe uh, and the OAS. In order to try to find commonalities between the countries, there is always the possibility to opt out within OAS instruments. So OAS instruments are never binding to all countries by the fact of adoption. So there is always the possibility for countries to join an instrument or not to do so, in order to keep the unity of the system. Without doing that, because the, I would say, the lack of full homogeneity politically, historically, culturally between the countries, it will be very difficult to have a common political system. So that flexibility allows also to keep the unity and to have one unique political fora to discuss the problem of the region. Is that useful? That, does that generate more positive than negative effect, or more negative than positive? Well, that's something that you have to decide by yourself uh, by analyzing the results. I think when crises arise, and the case of Honduras was one of them, the fact that that political fora exists is positive. The fact that countries can uh, put political pressure when a situation, a systemic situation happened in one of the countries, uh, I think is positive. If that happened always according to rule of law or sometimes follow the interests of one country, that is the balance between real politics and uh, rule of law. Uh, I have no answers on that. So. Each of you will have to have your own answer. Uh, I'm sure that it's not the full answer to your question, <coughs> but uh, it's difficult to have because it's so politically uh, debate nowadays that it's difficult to find. My final assumption is that these organs contribute to rule of law rather than a negative, it's a positive contribution rather than a negative contribution. Uh, according to what we saw during history. For example, during the crisis in, uh, talking about Argentina, uh, during the last military government, the pressure that the Inter-American Commission put over the military junta that was ruling the country between the 76 and 83 was key in order to generate the change, in order to stop certain practices or to reduce it, with especially the practice of disappearances. When the commission a right to Buenos Aires, uh, the military junta was unable to control it. They took it with victims, with families, with uh, trade unions, with civil society. And they gathered an information that exposed to the world uh, the atrocities was, was going on uh, internally within the country. And that leads to a strong, strong reaction from not only the OAS countries, but also worldwide. And that contributes to stop uh, certain uh, brutal practices within that government. So I think the balance is still positive. And if we look into the development of the jurisprudence of the Inter-American Court, again, someone will say, well, it's a little bit biased. And you can read that in the doctrine. We will discuss it uh, after the break. But it's also very progressive. Bias in the sense that it's progressive. Bias in the sense that push forward standards beyond of what currently perhaps is the international standard. Especially on same-sex marriage, um, gender identity, minorities. I think the Inter-American Court is in the forefront of a judicial development worldwide. If that correct, well, depends where you stand. I think that it's a, it's a very refreshing, refreshing development, although it could have backlash. And I will tell you a little bit more about what happened in Costa Rica after the adoption of the uh, advisory opinion in connection with the national local election.
So a very long, <laughs> long way uh, back. The difference, as uh, someone mentioned, of the European Union, well, remember that Council of Europe is not the same than the European Union. So there are two institutional developments, EU, although the European Union is in the European, uh, uh, the European developments within the European Union has been more or less parallel to the Council of Europe. In Council of Europe, we have 47 countries. In the European Union, we have only 28. <coughs> will be 27 soon uh, after Brexit. So it's a completely different reality. And uh, if you see how human rights standard has been developed within the, the European Union, well, it's quite late development. The, the Charter of Fundamental Rights has been adopted just a couple of years ago. Before that, there were no specific instrument for the protection of human rights in the European Union. So the real protection of human rights comes from the Council of Europe, rather than the European Union, within Europe. But it's true that the European Union held for the harmonization of policies within countries that are also part of Council of Europe. And that helped. I think in Europe, at the very end, you have more uh, harmonization within legal systems uh, and more than legal system, political systems. Although today that is a little bit at stake by uh, the coming back of nationalism and populism. But still, it's a more or less harmonic system. Latin America is much more diverse in that sense for history and tradition, especially within the North and the South, if you want, or within the Anglophone countries and the uh, Latin American countries. So it has been a difficult match there during the developments of the uh, regional institutions. Long answer for very important questions. Some instrument that you must be aware. Uh, these are more recent developments uh, in connection with minority rights. These are the only instruments that specifically target group and situation of vulnerabilities or minority, minorities per se. In connection with minorities, well, we have uh, the Convention Against Racism, Racial Discrimination, or Related for Intolerance, and the Convention Against All Forms of Discrimination and Intolerance. You see? Two conventions adopted the same year, uh, almost on the same topic. Almost <coughs> on the same topic. But they are not exactly the same, and I will tell you why. Uh, then we have a declaration on the right of indigenous people, 2016, very new instrument. The elimination of all forms of discrimination against persons <coughs> with disabilities, 1999, adopted before the Convention on the Right of Persons with Disabilities, 2006. So you see, again, the inter-American system on the forefront in this case. And uh, the Convention on Prevention Punishment of Eradication of Violence Against Women of 1994. In Europe, the Convention Against Domestic Violence, the Istanbul Convention, was adopted just a couple of years ago. So sometimes, it's another, it's not always the European system, the one in the forefront for the development of new standards. Sometimes that comes from the inter-American system. As it comes, uh, for example, the jurisprudence against discrimination of the European Court of Human Rights has been there for many, many decades before the inter-American court uh, start following. So what is the reason why we have almost Two conventions on the same matter. And this is an idea, again, of the political dynamics that exist in the region. The state discusses the adoption of one convention. They couldn't agree. They adopted two. Because one was too far, in con under the eyes of certain countries, toward the protection of uh, situations, entitlements, that they think they should not be uh, protected currently as standards. And I'm talking about, in particular, sexual orientation and gender 
identity. So the Convention Against All Forms of Discrimination and Intolerance also includes, because it's against all form, also includes the protection against discrimination based on gender identity, sexual uh, orientation, trans, transgender condition, etc., etc. And that's, of course, not the case of the Convention Against Racism, Racial Discrimination, and Related Forms of Intolerance. So some countries were ready to move forward, but others not. And they couldn't agree. And therefore, in order to provide an instrument that in any case will protect the rights of minorities, they decided to provide two instruments. So then states can choose which one to ratify. And in fact, there is only one of them that enter into uh, force, but with very low level of ratification. So up to date, the Convention Against Racism, Racial Discrimination, and Other Forms of Intolerance has only three member states. And they lower the bar, the bar of ratification to the minimum. In order to this convention and to into four, require more than one state. And the second convention, against all forms of discrimination, has been ratified only by Uruguay. And so it's still not in force. You see, states were very keen to discuss it, but not very keen on develop the binding standard. Because as soon as entry into four, it became binding. So states are not keen to do that. Even states, for example, like Argentina or Brazil, uh, that has introduced same-sex marriages within their own national legislation, they still didn't ratify these two conventions. So one thing is the national developments, the other thing is to recognize um, the jurisdiction to the regional bodies to adjudicate on that. Because as soon as this convention enters into force, the commission has the power to monitor their implementation. And that is key. So you will have a monitoring body that will follow up the implementation of these instruments. The right to a break, that's not a minority right, it's a universal right. So we always respect. That's very important. I have it here. So, just to move it, do we have any questions? Yes, before, wait a second. Uh, it just needs to be turned on. Ah. Uh, <laughs> Hi again. Uh, my name is Ali from Iraq. Nice to meet you. If I don't confuse, uh, there is um, in the American Convention of Declaration, there is no minority war. Is the weakness of a powerful point? Uh, yes, there are no minority war. Uh, it's not like the International Covenant uh, of Civil and Political Rights. At least you have one article that mentions minority, Article 27. In this case, we don't have it, but that has not been uh, a limitation per se for developing a jurisprudence that protect minorities. Because I think, and that is, the, that is the challenge for all of us. The key issue uh, for a person that is interested in for the protection of a particular group in situation of vulnerability, minority or not, is to use universal rights. So the same rights that everybody has, but focus in particular on how those rights could enhance the protection of that particular group that you're interested to deliver specific protection. And that, I think, was the, after many years of uh, development, what we have today uh, in the inter-American system. We have the commission and the board that pay attention to the situation of vulnerability rather than the minority character per se, but the situation of vulnerability of a given group, for example. Uh, children, unaccompanied children, migrants, irregular migrants, um, Afro-descendants. In that case, yes, you have a, a Russia-connected 
racial related minority uh, identity, indigenous people in particular. So all of this group has been to a certain extent singled out by these uh, two uh, bodies because their situation of vulnerability rather than their particular uh, minority character. With indigenous peoples, I would say it's slightly different. And then uh, I think the cultural diversity has been uh, the key element for developing a different uh, jurisprudence for the protection of their particular rights as indigenous people, rather than as individuals. So as part of the universally protected rights. But uh, at the beginning, yes, the lack of the specific provision perhaps uh, generated delay on developing this jurisprudence because it didn't exist. Any other question, comment? Uh, I, sorry, I just I don't want to take too much time, but um, one of the things that I know is, is very public, and I'd like to have your opinion on, on that, is the, the, the whole question of abortion rights mm -hmm. in, Latin, in Latin America. I know one of the reasons Canada didn't sign the American Convention on Human Rights is because it includes a clause that says that the right to life starts with conception. Yeah. And so people in Latin America have been using the human rights protection in order to punish and criminalize women who seek abortion. And you have a, also a, a convention on, on violence against women. And so one could argue legally that they're in contradiction to each other. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with conventions that are in contradiction with each other? <laughs> no, but, but, but there, it's, a, it's a legal question. It's, it's interesting when you, vote, when, you, when you adopt something on one document and adopt something that says something else that it does not. Yeah. I think the, the key issue here is to apply what uh, I call systemic interpretation. So uh, human rights uh, within the inter-American system, but worldwide, is a system. So in case that you find contradiction between instruments or between interpretations, well, you have to interpret those under the light of other instruments in order to try to find what is the answer that the entire system provides? And that could be, for example, the way that we can interpret the, the situation in connection with abortion. It's true that we still don't have a particular case on abortion within the inter-American system. We have one case that is very interesting, that is the case uh, of in vitro fertilization versus Costa Rica, I think it's 2012. Uh, where precisely the scope of protection of right to life was analyzed. Uh, because, as you mentioned, uh, life is protected since the, uh, the conception in general. And the word in general has been interpreted by the court given some kind of potential overture to abortion as a justified limitation to right to life. Will not be a doubt that abortion and abortion will affect right to life as interpreted by the Inter-American Court of Human Rights because the court interpreted that life start when life starts to develop in the womb of a mother, not outside. So let's say that you have an in vitro fertilization outside of the uterus well, that's not life, because it's not from the convention, at least protected as under the convention. It could be life outside of the convention, but not under the protection of the convention. Because the, the, the convention is clear that says it's since its um, conception. And according to the court, right or wrong, I'm not a scientist, so I cannot say that, but that's the interpretation of the court. The conception starts when uh, a fecundated egg is within the uterus of the man, not outside. But then, of course, if life already started at that moment and abortion happened after, abortion will affect right to life. But remember that right to life is not an absolute right. Right 
could be uh, a person could the, the the absolute right is not to be deprived arbitrarily of your life. So could be justification. In fact, capital punishment is not if it's applied with all the uh, provisions and, and safeguards provided by the convention will not be a violation of the American Convention, per se. And the same could happen with abortion. I don't know, because we don't have cases, so we need to wait until that. But the fact that the Commission said that the life is protected in general since the conception means that could be in particular. <coughs> and that could be the case. But, so that's the way to try to approach those kind of incompatibilities because then you will have a potential balance between two rights of life and here is the this is the way that I think we can construct cases for the protection of a particular right I'm coming to you one is the right to life of the mother of the woman that has a development of a, a fecundate egg on her uterus which is not only to be the private of her life, but also to have a life in dignity. To have a life, according to the jurisprudence of the court, in the way that she will be able to develop her project of life. So in the way that she will be able to develop what she thinks is the life that she wants for herself. So that's one right to life. The other right to life that we need to balance against would be the right to life of that fecundant egg. That according to the court is right to life, but because could enter into contradiction with the other right to life, you need to balance the age of them. For example, when uh, a thief is threatening someone else's life with a gun, and the person in, in, in uh, self-defense uh, suppress the, the thief, kill the thief, well, there are, we have two right to life there as well, right? But in defense of your own right to life, you will not be punished So it's a, because you deprive someone else of his or her life. Just because at that moment, those two rights to life enter into contradiction. And it was reasonable and justifiable for the person that has been threatened to protect his or her life. Abortion is a different case, but still we have two rights that could eventually contradict. How we resolve that potential contradiction, how we find uh, adequate balance, is what is the task of the Commission and the Court under the Convention. They have to resolve it under the Convention. Yes? Uh, to, to answer your question, I think that under the Inter-American Convention on Human Rights, there is a solution that is in Article 29, that is the principle pro homine. So when you have like uh, two rights that are that are um, incompatible, uh, you have to choose the the interpretation that more extended uh, for the protection of the right or less restrictive of the right and that's the task of the commission and the court but also uh, for the national courts uh, because of a uh, conventionality control mm -hmm. uh, but i think we are going to talk uh, about this later uh, yes to a certain extent but um, uh, it's important to bring it here but the prominent principle is also valid for the two rights uh, article if you have the chance to read the, the text of the convention, you will find Article 29, which basically says that you cannot, by interpreting the convention, you cannot deprive or limit the scope of protection of the same right as recognized under national law or in other international instruments. For example, if the Inter-American Convention, the American Convention recognized right to life in the less extension than the civil and political right covenant, you cannot limit the right of the Convention because the non-restrictive interpretation provided by Article 29. So, this is something uh, that we need to take into account. In the case of abortion, if 
the Human Rights Committee will have a jurisprudence pro-abortion, then we will have a problem. Because the Inter-American the Inter -American Court cannot provide interpretation less protected than the one provided by the uh, Human Rights Committee, in that sense. Because Article 29. But we don't have those cases. Therefore, we still don't know. But it's a fascinating. So it's, I think that is the, what I, I find uh, the important task of the lawyer or the legal advisor. You can construct that argumentation by providing all the elements that could help judges to arrive to the conclusion that you are pointed out. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm Paulina from Poland. I'm a lecturer at uh, State College. I just have uh, one question related to miscarriage and abortion and distinction between miscarriage and abortion because I have a lot of friends from Latin American countries and I know this is a huge problem in, in Central America mostly as well. Uh, probably in El Salvador, I have a friend from El Salvador and she told me about many cases that it was uh, misinterpreting, is misinterpreting of abortion and miscarriages and a lot of cases ended up that a woman was in prison like for 30 years of even the uh, you know lifetime imprisonment because of the miscarriage that was taken as an abortion and what about the convention and this issue because I think uh, I consider it as a huge problem for all the all the women in American countries. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I just said the, the convention protects the country that do that. It's 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 that crazy. I didn't know it. So uh, the problem is that okay. uh, <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit more confused. Even. No, I, I fully I fully agree with the, with him. Basically, one thing is the level of protection afforded at the regional level or even at the national level, and the other way, the other thing is the way that national authorities act the law. Not even interpret, but the way that they act the law, which is most of the cases, but hopefully not, not most of the cases, but some of the cases are central in this case, is even against national law. So the big, one of the most important problem within the region is the rule of law. We have good regional instrument. We can have fantastic national law, but national authorities don't follow. Especially, for example, in connection with. Um, the protection of rights to women and gender equality. Police don't, you can have fantastic law, but police don't respect the differentiated check, uh, checks when it's, uh, it's, a, it's a woman. The, 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 in connection with gender identity, for example, in Argentina, we have a fantastic law, but doesn't mean that when you go to the civil register, they will pay attention to your self-recognized identity. Not at all. So the problem is that pieces of legislation are not followed by national authorities at different levels. Police, municipalities, uh, legislators, central government. And that's a big problem. It's a systemic problem, I would say. And uh, well, that's why, since many years back, when the court condemned a country, or find that the country has been responsible for a violation of human rights, one of the measures for compensation is the measure for non-repetition. And in particular, to introduce training courses for state officials. For example, on <coughs> domestic violence, on right of women, right of child, right of uh, person, LGTB person, etc., etc. Because they don't know. They do not have the knowledge, they don't have the skills, they don't have the capacities. So they need to be trained, including the judiciary including the members of the Supreme Court. And that's, that's I will talk after the break on the case of uh, Atala Rifos versus Chile, uh, 2012, uh, or nine, 12, I think, uh, where basically the, the court was telling the members of the Supreme Court, you don't know the law, at least the regional law, <laughs> and you are not applying the law correctly. So one of the sanctions for the state authorities was 
to train the judicial authorities without saying in particular the judges of the Supreme Court, but including as part of the judicial authorities on the matter of gender identity and protection of sexual minorities. So that's part of the contradiction. The difference between what happened in the practice and what we have as a legal system, unfortunately. You're welcome. Yes. Thank you. I'm Natalia from Brazil. Obrigado. Uh, <laughs> um, yesterday, when we were talking about the European Court, uh, the lecturer told us that uh, they also have this uh, requirement of exhausting the domestic remedies, mm -hmm. but that, it, that there is a possibility of not doing this when you can show the court that, in your case, the domestic uh, system would not be effective at all. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm wondering if this has ever happened in the Inter-American Court and uh, what you think about this because I see in Brazil in some cases, um, mainly in cases where the, the abuse, uh, the crime, is committed, um, it's, also, it's also related to authorities, to the police, sometimes even to the judiciary, which has links with the police and governmental authorities, mm -hmm. not as independent as it should be. Uh, so yeah, I see sometimes witness elimination in a matter of months, and so no. that might be more difficult for when the case gets to the to the Inter-American Court. There might be no way anymore mm. to conduct investigations. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the question. I think it was Gaetano, the one delivering the Gaetano Pentasulia. He said. It was yesterday. Uh, I don't remember who. Oh. I will uh, give a look, uh, because he's a, he's a good friend. Uh, yes, the Inter-American uh, system and the American Convention of Human Rights has exactly the same requirement. So you have, the, within the exhaustion of, uh, exhaustions of national remedies, you have exceptions. And those exceptions are connected with the availability of the remedy and the efficacy of the remedy. Um, and that was since the first, court, the first case in 1988 on force of disappearance. For example, uh, in that case, it was required that uh, the victims have to exhaust the national remedy, and the national remedy for forced disappearance was an habeas corpus. The habeas corpus is a remedy uh, that you have when you don't know the whereabouts of the person in order to produce the person. But in that case, the national law requires that the victim itself introduce the habeas corpus which is completely a nonsense because it's the victim, the one that nobody knows where it is. So in that case, that remedy was not effective. And therefore, the court said, well, you don't need to exhaust a remedy that is not effective. <coughs> or in other cases, when the legal system uh, has systemic problems, for example, in order to receive uh, complaints from minorities, from indigenous peoples, then because those cases is clear and it's a systemic problem already uh, identified by the court, in those cases the victim doesn't need to exhaust to those remedies because it's clear that will lead to nowhere. So it will be no real chances to have access to justice. So it's, um, in, in uh, many cases, because governments very often introduce that exception, the exception that the victims didn't exhaust the national uh, domestic remedies. So the jurisprudence has been developed since uh, the beginning, basically. And uh, it focuses on that. Also, also focus on the uh, requirement of six months. Uh, because, for instance, uh, that period that exists should be conducive in that period that the person will be able to submit an application. That means that we'll be have full access to the material, to the case law, to the uh, document of the case. But if something of that is prevented, then the time is extended. Because the limit will work as long as you have full access to submit your case and full access to the documents. If you don't, until you gain full access, then there is a suspension of the uh, time. So the court. And here we come back to another principle of the jurisprudence of the Inter-American Court. 
which is effect util, or principle of effectiveness. All procedural uh, norms need to be interpreted in the way that will provide effective access to the, inform to the enjoyment of the rights. We cannot, that's the position of the court, we cannot interpret the procedural norm in the way that will prevent have access to the right. So limitations need to be interpreted in a restrictive manner. Because per se, a limitation will eventually lead toward a limitation in the enjoyment of the right. So should be interpreted in a non in a restrictive manner. Any question or comment? Five minutes left? Very good. So I think before we let me go a little bit faster. Before we go to the jurisprudence of the court in, in our next uh, time, I will introduce the different powers that we have, uh, or the different tools that we have within the interrelated system. Uh, mixing a little bit the tools of the commission and the court. So first, in connection with the commission, the commission has been very instrumental in visiting countries where human rights situation has been violated systematically. So the country visit is very important on the hands of the Commission. The same regarding, for example, the political supervision. The Commission engages in uh, discussion with political authorities, facilitate dialogue, is a body that has the mandate to promote and protect human rights in the region, but has a dual mandate. One is a political diplomatic mandate under the Charter, the Declaration, and the Convention. And the other one is a quasi-judicial mandate. So exercising the diplomatic mandate, the Commission engages in discussion with governments, visit countries, issue country reports, issue specific thematic reports to determine which are the standard of protection in the region. But on the other hand, the Commission also received individual petitions for individual human rights violations. And those cases will be the cases that eventually will end in the court. Victims in the region can never submit directly a case to the court. That can never happen. That's a different feature with the uh, European system. In Europe, you go directly to a court. We don't have a commission. After you extinguish national remedies. In the Americas, you have to go always to the Commission, independently if your country <coughs> is part of the American Convention or not. For example, in the case of Canada, the United States, Cuba, Venezuela now, nowadays, uh, they are not part of the American Convention. But they still, the individuals within those countries, still can submit the case to the Commission. Why? Because the Commission will assess the protection of human rights under the OAS Charter and the American Declaration. The American Declaration is not binding, but the OAS Charter, it is binding. And the Commission has a mandate to protect human rights under the Charter according to the rights recognized in the Declaration. In short, for countries member of the American Convention, for example, Argentina, Brazil, Mexico, Costa Rica, etc., etc., 22 countries, 23. Uh, victims within those countries will have to submit cases to the American, the Inter-American Commission first, and the Commission will decide in case of violation if later on will submit the case to the court. The power to submit cases to the court is in the hands of the Commission, not in the hands of the victim. And you will ask me, Anna, which are the criteria that the Commission use in order to decide which cases will submit and which not? Well, those criteria have been identified by the court in the status of the Inter-American Court, uh, the Rule of Procedure, sorry, and I have it here, which is Article 45 of the Rule of Procedure, referral to the case to the court. You can read it later. But basically, there are four criteria that the Commission will always follow in order to submit the case to the court. First, taking into consideration the position of the petitioner. 
which is the position of the victim. Does the victim want to go to the court or not? The second, the nature and seriousness of the violation. Human rights violations could be a very minor one or a very serious one. All are human rights violations. For example, a violation of a privacy because someone opened letters, that's a human rights violation. But also, uh, systematic use of torture is human rights violation. And we have different uh, level of seriousness there. The need to develop or clarify the case law of the system. For example, the case of abortion. If the commission would like to know what is the position of the court in order to make sure that the, we know which is the level of protection afforded by the inter-American system, it could eventually refer the case to the court. And finally, the future effect of the decision within the legal system of member states. So, which effect the decision of the court will have in connection with national systems, which will be the impact at national level. And this is very important because it could lead toward, for example, constitutional modifications. That was the case on um, mandatory application of that penalty. Do you know what is that? Mandatory application of that penalty. So that is the case, and with this we'll finish. I think we are uh, finished now. That was the case in some of the Latin American countries. Criminal code ordered judges to sentence a person to capital punishment if he is found guilty for murder. No personal consideration of the condition of the victim, the condition of the perpetrator, or any other circumstances. That means murder, application, mandatory application of capital punishment. The court found, in cases against Trinidad Tobago, that that was a violation of the Inter-American, the American Convention. Because the judge has to have the possibility to evaluate the different circumstances of the case. Uh, so in that case, the court ordered to change the constitutional provisions of Trinidad and Tobago Constitution. Unfortunately, Trinidad and Tobago decided to not do that and denounced the American Convention. Trinidad and Tobago left the American Convention, that is possible, it's regulated by the Convention, in 1999 because it didn't want to change the provisions of application of mandatory capital punishment in its constitution. Uh, unfortunately, Trinidad and Tobago today is still not part of the system, not part of the convention, but still part of the system. So sometimes what the court order is too invasive into the national legal systems that generate uh, backlash as a result, as in this case. <laughs>